it is to me an intoxicating thing to know God and simultaneously a frightening thing that I would be known by God. Because as Isaiah in the presence of the throne room, the year that King Uzziah died, recorded in Isaiah chapter six, he sees God and beholds his holiness and is aware of his own innate sinfulness. And he sees the huge chasm that is between the two of them. But what bridges the gap there is the love of God for his fallen sinful mankind. And the angel takes with the tongues the coal from the altar, presses it to Isaiah's lips. And then God says, whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. When Isaiah saw God, the result was conviction for his sin. Woe unto me because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord to know God in his holiness and his infinite, unassailable righteousness and absolute perfection and omnipotence all personified is far too much for any of us to behold. Moses came in proximity to the train of God's robe on Mount Sinai and his face emitted light when he came down from the mountain as a result of it. That is how far away God's holiness is from our sin. But we sinners may be partakers of the grace that God freely offers. It is a scary thing to be known by God. It is a wondrous thing that we may know God. Everything that we have done, everything that we have done has been known by God. Let's all just sit in the discomfort of that for a minute, shall we? Welcome to Highlands Community Church. I sincerely hope you feel deeply uncomfortable right now because that means you grasp the concept. You know what I mean? To feel conviction for sin is a good thing. I, I don't, I don't, wish, I don't wish pain on anybody, but if you feel the conviction for sin, if you feel pain in your heart because you know that you've sinned against the holy God, that is a good thing. That is a good thing. I don't take delight in the fact that you are feeling pain, but I take delight in the fact that that means you belong to the Savior. That means that you are His. The Holy Spirit of God is convicting you for sin. You know that you are His child, and you know that these things can't subsist in your life. You've got to repent. You've got to repent. You've got to repent. So this is a good thing. This pain in your heart, the idea of being known by God, the discomfort that it brings to feel conviction for sin, that drawing unto repentance can be only from the Holy Spirit of God. So take comfort in the discomfort because it indicates that you are his. Everything that we have done, everything that we will do, all of it is known by God. God loved you before you committed these sins, and there in the midst of them, he still loved you despite your sin, and then post-sin, his love for you has lost none of its potency. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if there was any, any system of measurement in your heart that associates the love that God has for you with your conduct, throw the ruler away. There's nothing you could ever do to detract from God's immeasurable love for you. And repetitive, rebellious sin away from him, he, he will discipline you, he will call you to repentance, there will be pain, you'll suffer the consequences for your own sinful actions. But God's love remains unmitigated and his promise is steadfast and sure. It is a dreadful thing to me to be known by God, but it is a wondrous thing to know God. This text of 1 Timothy 5 will end face to face with the notion of being fully known by God. 1 Timothy chapter 5 appears on page 992 and the ESV Bibles in the seats with us here at Highlands Renton. I want to say we love you to Highlands Kent. Would you guys join me in shouting we love you to Highlands Kent on the count of three? Yeah. 
right? One, two, three, we love you! <laughs> so people added on the Highlands Kennedy, and that was good. That was good. So, 1 Timothy chapter 5. This chapter is going to cover a lot of ground, but it's going to end up confronting us on our sin. It is going to continue with the theme of Timothy's own heart as Paul the Apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, coaches his protege Timothy to be the pastor of the church of the city of Ephesus. In chapter four, he called upon Timothy to not let anybody look down on him because of his youth. The fact that he was young should, mean, should, should not cause people to look down on him, but he should aspire then to set an example for all believers in his speech, life, love, faith, and purity. And now he's gonna give further instructions for how the church functions. You'll notice that there, there are some more specifics in the books of First and Second Timothy than there are in Titus. It's because Timothy is doing ministry at a church that Paul helped plant and pastored for three years. And according to, according to the book of Acts, Paul in Acts chapter 20 warns about the wolves that are coming in to the church at Ephesus. So Timothy is the pastor there. He's given this, he's given this set of standards by which to, to weed out the unqualified overseers and the unqualified among the diaconate. Titus is given a similar set of standards, but he's come, his comes with a commissioning to appoint elders and overseers in towns all around the island of Crete. So Timothy's work was to cut people all right, Titus's work was to appoint people, but both of them were given, this, uh, given a similar standard. Then in chapter four, it gets more personal. In chapter five, we see a mixture of both. We see both further instructions for how Timothy is to relate to the people around him. We see some instructions for how the church is to care for widows. And then there comes this soaring and piercing word about the Lord and his knowledge of our sin. So let's look at chapter five together. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. But this is pleasing in the sight of God. If, you're, if, you're, uh, if you have grown children and they're sitting with you, do not let your amen to that one be too loud. But do say amen. It's gotta be just the right volume. You know what I mean? <laughs> she who is truly a widow, left all alone, right, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age having been the wife of one husband, and having a reputation for good works, if she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, has devoted herself to every good work. I keep thinking about my mother in this text. It just reminds me of her. But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house. Not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows married, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Let the elders who rule be well considered, worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, 
so that the, uh, so that the rest may stand in fear and the presence of God in Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, meaning anointing somebody as an elder or overseer, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some men are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. This is a fascinating text. You see how much ground Paul covered in just 25 verses? I mean, speaking to Timothy as he relates to everybody around him, giving instructions for which widows of the widows the church is to look after, giving instructions for people whose, whose jobs are preaching and teaching, <laughs> right? And then comes this theologically rich, these last two verses so potent. Do you see what I mean? Anybody else feel just conviction when you get to those last two verses? Oh, man, man, this is powerful text. This is, this is fire, this is fire in our hands. So with proper respect for it, let's, let's go back and look at this piece by piece. All right, verses one and two. This exhortation comes after chapter four's instruction that Timothy not let anybody look down on him because he is young. And he's called to set an example for the believers in speech and life and love, faith and impurity. And if, I'm not, this is not a trick question, what does this instruction make the church if to Timothy all the men older than him are fathers, all the other men his age and younger are brothers, all, right, all the women in the church are to be approached like they are his, his mothers, all of the women in the church who are his age and younger should be approached as sisters with absolute purity, all right? What does this make the church at Ephesus for Timothy? It's a family. It's a family. It's the family of God. Every man who is older, he is to treat like a father. Every woman who is older, he is to treat like a mother. Every man who is his age and younger is like a brother to him. Okay, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. We call everybody brother. All, right. All the women in his church who are the same age as him and younger are to be approached as sisters with absolute purity, with all purity. This makes God's house a family. And I think that is beautiful and I think that is necessary. And I could name several young people in our community who need a family. And I know many people in our church for whom this is their only family in this life. So if Paul gave this instruction to Timothy, do you see your reflection in the text as well? Have you fallen short of this instruction that Paul gave to Timothy? Right, have you seen older men? Have you seen the younger men? Have you seen them as your sons? Have you taken it upon yourself to mentor them, to show them affection, give them affirmation, all right, you are a man of God, you're on the right track. I see holiness evident in your life and the Holy Spirit is bearing fruit through you. Older women, do you see this as well? Do you see the younger women of the church as your daughters in the faith? Do you encourage them? I love what I see God doing in you. The light of the gospel shines so brightly in your beautiful eyes. The sound of your voice brings hope and healing to those who need it. Thank you for your ministry. Likewise, young bucks, all right, are you approaching those who are older in the faith with the proper esteem and respect that they are our fathers, they are our mothers, that we treat one another with, with utmost purity and with affection? The family of God is the church. I am blessed by this. I'm blessed to be able to say firsthand right, that the, the family of God transcends the boundaries of countries and the edges of continents, that the Holy Spirit of God is able to embrace across entire oceans. And the same Holy Spirit that we experienced, we did ministry in Orlando, in South Florida, is the same Holy Spirit who abides here 
a Highlands Community Church, all right? And I've seen that same Holy Spirit at work in distant shores around the globe. It is a beautiful thing. The family of God transcends nationality. It transcends ethnicity. It transcends continents. It transcends oceans. It makes each of us a family. If, you, if you've been familyless, Highlands Community Church is here to adopt you. Welcome to the family. Amen, Highlands Community Church. Amen. All right, you have a family. It is the family of God, and you belong here. And what we have in common is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every one of us, every one of us who is saved was once defined by our sin. Every one of us has been adopted as sons and daughters, heirs of the kingdom of heaven. That is a beautiful thing to have in common. So if you have been treating church like a solipsist, if you've been approaching church like this is just a show that we put on for you individually and you experience it right there in isolation in your seat by yourself, you are missing the church experience. You are, you are missing the point of all of this. Find a small group or start a small group. There's a curriculum that's already provided that works in conjunction with our sermon series. Could not be any easier for you. Okay, use the curriculum. Teach in conjunction with the pulpit. Begin community and have raw authenticity with believers who are in the same phase of life as you or in the same community as you and walk step by step as a family. This was a huge ministry to me when I was a college kid. My accountability partner's name was Deji. Ayo Deji Alofunzo Abatam was his, was his full name. We called him Deji, right? And Deji and I were adopted by various families in the church as college kids at, at Thomasville Road Baptist Church in Tallahassee, Florida. And we were walking through the corridor and I heard a strange sound coming in the distance as I walked through. And I, I, I tried to figure out what it was. And it dawned on me, oh wait, that's right, children exist. As a college kid, I forgot that like children existed. Because <laughs> everybody in my world was like 18 to 22 years, uh, years of age. And if you took some of those classes in like the big settings, like one of my classes had 1,700 people in it, all right? And, and uh, there was a professor, and he was this big. All right, and he was probably older than 22, and he was down at the front of the giant auditorium. And so for me to walk around the church grounds and hear children playing on the playground was like this reminder, oh, that's right. That's right, and, and there were, these, there were these, uh, these more seasoned saints, okay? Do you, do you follow me? Do you hear what I'm saying? Okay, the more seasoned saints. They'd been through some wars and they'd fought violently for the Lord, for, uh, violently for, the Lord for, for decades, and they saw these two young bucks, and they walked up and they said, when is the last time you had a meal that was cooked in a house? <laughs> and, and neither Daisy nor I could really, we couldn't count the days since Christmas, so it didn't really come to us right away. And they said, okay, you're gonna come to our house and we're gonna feed you properly, all right? And so we walked with them, all right? They, they said, okay, follow us. We drove, went to their house, okay? We'd forgotten what a house was, <laughs> all right? Because like, we'd lived in a dorm, all right? And now we saw a house with, with a mother and a father and their kids, and there, there, was this, there was cooking equipment right there in the house. Like, they lived in the same place as the cooking equipment. It was fascinating to us as college kids. And they, they just asked us, what are you majoring in? How are your grades? Are you, are you keeping up? Are you, are you getting to class in the morning? I know 9 a.m. comes real early. <laughs> <laughs> and this simple act of love meant the world to us. And we drove home. We went, we went, went, back, went back to campus, having been reminded of, of what the world was really like. Because the family of God was at work. That was a beautiful blessing to two college kids. All right, the family of God at work, thank you so much, Highlands Community Church, for being a family, for being a family. Be mothers and fathers to the fatherless and motherless. All right, treat those who are older than you like mothers and fathers in the faith. Let everybody who steps into this place know that we are Christians because of our love that we have. Let them step in, experience the love of God, become addicted, be filled by the Holy Spirit, convicted for sin. By that Holy Spirit, let them then confess with their mouths, Jesus is Lord. Believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead, and so be saved. Love relentlessly. Love Highlands Community Church. Love, period. Love. Now, from verses 3, from verse 3 through verse 16, is a long section of instructions 
All right, this is a long set of instructions for how the church was to care for widows and which widows specifically should qualify for this program that was built into the church at Ephesus. There's not quite, there's, there's not quite the same set of elaborate instructions in the book of Titus as there is here in Timothy. I believe this is in part because Paul knew directly what was happening in the church at Ephesus. He'd helped plant it and pastored it for three years. And so he's passing on these specific instructions to Timothy, knowing the context of Ephesus and what, what, kind of, what kind of details would be needed specifically. Because apparently the church had offered a very generous, very generous caretaking program for widows. And some, some had taken advantage of it. And some people had abandoned the, the widows in their own families to say, okay, the church is just going to handle this. All right, we're not going to take care of mom at all. The church has this. All right, I'm uh, in, in my, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on my, my one-year anniversary as a, as a lead pastor, and I've learned something uh, profound here. There's a whole other phase of ministry to be experienced when you as an adult must take care of your own parents. Some of you are in the midst of that right now. I mean, I see faces, and I, I, my heart goes to, I know, I know faces at, at Highlands, Highlands Kent as well are in the same exact ministry. Like, how do you minister to your parents when they can no longer take care of themselves? All right, this is, this is, there's, there are instructions here regarding that. There were some people who said, I'm just, gonna let, I'm just gonna leave mom at the church and let the church take care of her. And Paul is saying, no, take care of your family. All right, take care of your family. Let the widows who are truly widows, meaning like there's nobody left to take care of them, let the church take care of those. All right, if the widows are of marrying age, let them, let them remarry. All right, and, and if, if, there are, uh, if there are widows who have these long, rich, beautiful, fruitful legacies of ministry, all right, having a reputation for good works, having brought up children, shown hospitality, having washed the feet of the saints, having cared for the afflicted, devoted herself to every good work, like take care of this woman as a church. This paints a picture of a godly woman, and that particular picture is, is repugnant to some versions of modern feminism, because it shows this woman who cares for others above herself. It, co- it shows this woman who has brought up children, and I hear a narrative in modern society that, that downplays that that devalues the act of caring for children. But the but scripture lifts this woman up, who shows hospitality. That is a spiritual gift. You know that is a spiritual gift? That is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, the, the, the gift of hospitality, at some, uh, it plays, it plays a, a heavenly role that some of us would actually, scripture says, care for angels without realizing it. Like the, the, the act of showing hospitality is of spiritual significance and is a work of the Holy Spirit of God through somebody who is so gifted. Showing hospitality is not, is not an act of subservience and inferiority, but I hear that narrative as though like, oh, the, uh, the, the person who would aspire to do exactly this, to raise children, show hospitality, wash the feet of the saints, care for the afflicted, devote herself to every good work. That this, this beautiful woman, the profile of a beautiful woman as painted by verses nine through, nine through 10, nine and 10, as though it would downplay and devalue this and it would cause some women who would aspire under that say, oh wait, maybe that's not what I'm supposed to be as a woman. Scripture paints a picture of a godly legacy to be honored and cared for and lifted up. Because society will not extol such women as these described in verses nine and 10, church, may we extol and take care of and honor women who live such godly lives. I see the silhouette of my mother in verses nine and 10, who designed the house I grew up in around hosting parties and feeding people, all right? If you ever happen to be in Pensacola, Florida, all right, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, all right, if you're willing to make make the 25 minute drive from the airport, my mom will feed you, okay? If you find her on Facebook and tell her, hey, I'm gonna be in Pensacola, all right, en route to such and such, I would love a home-cooked meal from Jesse's mom. I promise you, you will have the most delicious boule base you've ever had in your life. My grandmother, Josephine, okay, you will have, you will have some, of the most, some of the most delicious homemade salsa you've ever had. 
Okay, you, she will take excellent care of you. She designed the house around feeding people, but she, she stands uh, under five feet tall, okay? And so the counters in the kitchen are all, <laughs> you know, you, you've, got, you've got to stoop a little bit to get, <laughs> to get to your food, but this house even is designed to be able to have a line that wraps like down the hallway, all right, through the foyer, through the kitchen, around the island, and then so that way we circle up and we pray. And my dad, with his big, like baritone voice resonating off the walls, would pray, thank you, God, for the bond of love that we share, right? And he would pray and bless the food. And we pray for the salvation of people who are with us. If you, if you were uh, in, in ministry of some sort, there was a place upstairs where multiple people, worship leaders trying to get back on their feet, would stay and live at my parents' house over the course of time, right? They, they would stay there and they, they would sing for their supper. They would leave worship every night from the stage that my mom designed on the fireplace. <laughs> and we would, have, we would have 40 plus people at our house growing up. The gift of hospitality is a profound one. I, I try to, I try to, uh, to tally up the number of missionaries and worship leaders and pastors who have lived at my parents' house over the years, the number of people who have been fed. It is a, it is a profoundly spiritually significant gift. And it reminds me of my mother. And modern feminism would say that she sold herself short, all right? And I would say that she has lived up to a godly legacy. And if there are any women in the room who are trying to choose between what scripture just paints as this godly legacy and what feminism would have you live out, all right, telling you that this is, this is somehow wasteful and this is somehow self-exonerating, I would call you under the biblical model any day. And know that at Highlands Community Church, you are respected and you are loved and you are admired and you are appreciated. And the scripture lifts up a woman such as these and even calls for the church to care for widows whose entire ministries and testimonies are reflected here. This is solid doctrine. This is practical church polity. It was written directly to Timothy for a certain context, but there are ways that we can also apply these same teachings in our modern ministry, isn't there? Thank you, by the way, Highlands Community Church, for the beautiful generosity you've shown our benevolence fund by which we can care for widows. Thank you. Do you know that we at Highlands Community Church do this? Thank you, Highlands Community Church. Thank you for your incredible, incredible generosity to this exact fund. Again, as we study a church that tells you, uh, study, study a book of the Bible that tells you how to do church, it's not a drill, <laughs> all right? This, is, this, is, this is influences exactly how we function. All right, and this brings us to one of the more awkward passages of scripture for me to preach. All right, uh, another passage that talks about preachers and teachers. Okay, it's weird for me to preach verses about preaching, right? But I'm grateful for your grace. Highlands Community Church, will you show me some grace as I navigate some weird verses? All right, thank you, thank you. All right, it's the word of God. Some of you may have been with me tracking all the way through and then suddenly he starts talking about oxen. You're like, okay, I was with you until he said, don't muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. Did Paul have a stroke? Like mid-letter? What just happened? <laughs> All right, I wanna give some context. I wanna give some context. You wanna zoom in on these verses. All right, verse 17 says, let the elders who rule be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, I, I pause at these verses at the risk of seeming self-serving, but, but this verse speaks for itself, and Highlands Community Church has a beautiful tradition of loving its preaching pastors very, very well. All right, preaching at large in the corporate church, the church across the U.S. especially, preaching is being minimized. And there's a trend in modern churches wherein people who are preaching pretend like they aren't really preaching and will downplay the importance of preaching and even deride people who spend a lot of time preparing their sermons well. And we'll point to other aspects of the office as though those were more important. But these these trends are directly contrary to what we've just read in 1 Timothy 5. If God is calling you to preach, that is a blessed thing. Labor in that. Did you see the word labor in verse 17? Labor in preaching and teaching. So if you preach, if you teach, if you lead a small group, if you lead a Bible study, if you have a preaching ministry... All right, I know that a lot of times in our Saturday night service and our 8 a.m. service, I will meet people who are on staff at other churches. Did you know that? There are, others, there are some churches that send their staff to join us here on Saturday nights and sometimes on, on, uh, at 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings. If that's you, labor in it. Don't just phone it in. Okay, don't just wing it. 
Don't just listen to a podcast and regurgitate it. Okay? Labor at preaching and teaching. Devote time and set it aside and labor at preaching and teaching. All right? You are presenting God's word to God's people. That is no small thing. This is a sacred moment. Look at 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You are called, if you speak, to speak as though you're speaking the very words of God because this is God's word. These are God's people. We are filled with God's spirit. So don't waste God's time. Preach the words of God unflinching. Do not apologize for them. You present them and present them fully and boldly. Verse 18, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves is his wages. This is also in Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians 9. Okay? 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 through 14. He goes into greater detail, even uses that same verse. That, what he just referred to was Deuteronomy 25, 4, and he's gonna, he's gonna unpack it in greater detail in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 through 14, where he uses the same Deuteronomy reference. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink, meaning we who have planted churches? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of, uh, of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I, Paul writes, who have, no, who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his, as, at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher should thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Paul was a bivocational traveling church planter and missionary. He would build tents as a way of subsidizing his life so that he could plant churches. And then after having planted those churches, he would expect those churches to fund his salary. And if they didn't, he would chide them for it. He, pride, he simultaneously prided himself on being self-sustaining, but also would chide churches for not offering to pay his salary so that he could then plant the church and then keep building tents and go around the Mediterranean Sea planting more churches and then have them take care of their pastors so that those who would proclaim the gospel would earn their living from the gospel. This is a fascinating thing, isn't it? This is a fascinating, a fascinating teaching it calls, upon those who, it calls upon those who preach and teach, who share the gospel to earn their living from the gospel. It is, it is a, a growing trend among churches to see to it that like, the, the pastor gets paid as little as possible. Gratefully, that is not the case at Highlands Community Church. Right? Our pastors are well taken care of, and, and for that, we praise God. But... Often, our brothers at other churches are not well taken care of. All right? They are not well funded. They, they're, they're, their children go underfunded. They're, they live a lifestyle of, of poverty that according to 1 Corinthians 9, according to 1 Timothy 5, is not biblical. Right? It is not actually called upon that they would take a vow of poverty. That is a Catholic teaching that is unbiblical. Right? Rather, what Paul calls upon the churches that he planted was to take care of their, their pastors well. So thank you, Highlands Community Church. Praise God. Our staff, is, our staff is well taken care of. I'm grateful for that. But let, let it be on our hearts as well, our brother and sister, like our sister churches who do not take care of their pastors well. If you see a pastor and he's not employed by Highlands Community Church, pay for his lunch, okay? 
Now, verse 19 and 20 gives these instructions for how to rebuke an elder when he steps out of line. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Okay? Verse 20, as for those who persist in sin, meaning they've been busted in sin, they're confronted and they continue to sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. All right, I've watched this put into action before. I've seen this happen before. All right, there, was a, there was a man who served on staff at a church. He'd been confronted in sin and could not repent from it right away. And so he's brought forward on the platform. My wife and I had moved to Nashville. I was on staff at a church in Orlando. That's where I became an author. Lifeway moved us up to Nashville, and I was writing curriculum. I was writing Explore the Bible. And while we were there, we had to find a church and join it. It was weird. We had to, like, walk in the front door to the church. We'd never done that before. <laughs> like, receive a bulletin, you know, and introduce ourselves. That was weird for us. We were actually able to walk clear across the lobby. Never done that in my life before. I've never been able to walk across a church lobby until this weird season. I'd seen people church shop, and that church shopping would last like a year, and you go like a full year. I've met like really godly, awesome families. They're like, we're just trying to find the right church for us. And we're, and we're like, well, find one already. Like, find that imperfect church and just join it already and start serving, because for a year now, you haven't been giving consistently, you haven't been serving consistently, you haven't developed deep relationships anywhere. So I saw that as a pastor, and now church shopping myself, I gave us six weeks. We will visit six churches and join one. I know how it's going to end. We're going to find a church that's not quite perfect. It'll become less perfect because we join it. <laughs> and man, in Nashville, the churches are legit. <laughs> oh, man, like land is cheap and buildings are huge and the musicians are all awesome. And they sound kind of country, but it's still awesome, you know. And man, oh, the South, like the churches in the South, it's crazy. Like you have an intersection and all four corners of the intersection are like Bible preaching churches, you know, whose pastors have PhDs in the Old Testament and then like whose worship pastors have like Grammy nominations under their belt. Nashville. And so we found a church and then this, this pastor is brought under discipline as described in this text. We scooted up in our seats and pulled our popcorn close. And this man is confronted over sin and he right there just confesses his sin to the body of believers. And we heard shouts from the balcony. We love you. We love you. We love you. And the, the crowd stood up and he was still confessing sin. And the people rose up and they flooded the altar and they embraced him and his wife while he was still speaking. I told Jesse, my wife, we're joining this church. <laughs> and we walked down the, to, to the altar and we found a funny looking bald dude, Pastor Andy. He's a great guy. And we said, we want to join the church. He was like, are you sure? <laughs> Today? So like, yes, we just saw church discipline exercised upon an elder, elder who confessed and is repentant and is showered with love and affection. We joined that church. And that's where we served for the three and a half years that we lived in Nashville. It's absolutely exquisite. When you see these instructions exercised, it is, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. All right, and that's what leads to verse 21, this huge charge in the presence of God and Christ Jesus of the elect angels. He's specific here so as to distinguish them from fallen angels. I charge you to keep the rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. It should be incredibly difficult to become a pastor. It should be more difficult to become a pastor than to be elected to politics. And evidently it is. <laughs> Verse 23, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach. All right, there it is, your life verse. All right? But don't be too enthusiastic about it, all right? You'll notice that this verse is in parentheses. Okay, see the parentheses? Did you see, did you see the word little there? A little wine? Okay, 
All right, do not go straight from here and toast to 1 Timothy 5.3, all right, 5.23. See, a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments, all right? There was a medical, medical reason for the recommendation, all right? And also, please get a new life verse. <laughs> now comes the final two. The sins of some people are conspicuous going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later so also good works are conspicuous and even those that are, that, that are not cannot remain hidden. All right, look, if you, if you feed the poor and you don't tweet about it, the poor are still fed and you need not worry if you've done this thing to publicly signal your virtue or if you've done it out of a genuine intent. Okay, it is possible, studies show, it is possible to do ministry work and not broadcast it on the internet. All right, you can do this thing and not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Not do it like the Pharisees did for show, but in secret where the Lord sees and the Lord knows. This is a beautiful thing. Now, conversely, within these same two Verses, if you've, if you've become really good at keeping your sins a secret while the sins of others around you bring them down, eventually what you have done will be made known. Okay, do not be deceived, Deuteronomy says. Your sin will find you out. Everything that has been hidden will be laid bare. Let it be a testimony of humble repentance and full restoration in Jesus, not your downfall. What the enemy meant for evil, God will use for good. So repent, confess, establish accountability, and secure victory over your sin. Be healed from your secret sin today in Jesus' name. To be known completely by God as a sinner, aware of your own sin can be a frightening prospect. But did you know that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us? Even in our sin, he still loved us. Even despite our sin, we are loved of God. What you have done in secret will be laid bare and is already known by our holy, just judge of God. And it is for sins such as ours that he comes in on a war horse to slay and to conquer evil forevermore one day. Would you confess to God that which he already knows you've done? Right, would you confess freely and honestly and candidly to God, I have sinned. That conviction that you feel for your sin is a good thing. It is a good thing. In fact, if it's not in your heart, if you're planning to sin after this, right? if you have zero regret whatsoever for any of the sin in your life, my friend, you are not a child of God. You're not saved. All right? The world is not full of people who sin and who don't necessarily. Rather, people who sin and don't feel any conviction of the Spirit for whatsoever and do not repent whatsoever at all, they don't belong to God. But Christians, if a Christian sins, you're miserable, convicted, you come home, you repent. So if you've been struggling with sin, praise God that you're actually struggling at all. That's a good sign. All right, the, fact that you, the fact that you can sin and feel conviction for it means that you're a child of God. So repent, 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 by all means. But let me, let me warn you, if you feel zero conviction, zero remorse whatsoever for your sin at all, this means that you're not saved. And today is the day that you need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. As the Holy Spirit of God draws upon your heart, today is the day that you are saved. Because every sin that you've committed will be laid bare before the holy, just judge of a God. He knew about your sin. He knows about your sin. He offers you grace nonetheless. So that drawing that you feel right now upon your heart, it is the Holy Spirit, and today is the day of salvation for you. So would you pray with me right here and now to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ? God, I confess 
that I have sinned and I have fallen short of the glory of God. And I confess, God, that the wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the way. I believe that Jesus is the truth. I believe that Jesus is the life. And I know there's no way I can come to you, Father, except through Jesus. So I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Highlands Community Church, would you proclaim Jesus is Lord? Say it, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now God, let me be saved. Let me be saved. I know my sins will be laid bare, but let them be laid bare before the one who has pardoned me for them, who loves me despite them, who has called me out of them, who called me by name from my grave and resurrected my sinful soul. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. It is the only hope my sinful soul has. Thank you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and worship some of us brand new believers for the very first time praising our Savior. Let's worship.